July meeting. Uh, I think due to a technical snafu, we were not able to post them online, but you should have a hard copy. It's a very brief document. Give me a second to look at it. And then I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes as they are presented before us. Thank you. Any second? Second. Any further discussion? Corrections? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Say no. All right, motion carries. They are approved. Let us move on then. Our main order of business today is uh, the policy changes to the federal SNAP uh, program and the impact that they will have on Vermonters. Um, so first I'd like to ask uh, Sean Brown to uh, to come and, and give Great. Well. Of course, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Sean Brown, Deputy Commissioner for the Department for Children and Families Economic Services Division. Appreciate the opportunity um, this afternoon to come and um, present before the committee. Um, um, Back in July, late July, the Trump administration um, issued a proposed rule that impacts. Uh, yep, uh, the Trump administration um, issued a proposed rule that will impact um, the Three Squares Vermont program in Vermont, um, and it will have a, a large impact. Um, currently, uh, for the last 20 years, states were able to use two categories of eligibility um, to. Um, determine eligibility for Vermonters um, or anyone seeking um, supplemental food benefits. Um, in Vermont, we call that program Three Squares Vermont. At the federal level, it's known as the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, referred to as SNAP. Um, we could first look at a family if they were eligible under the standard income-based eligibility, standard categorical eligibility, and then there was additional flexibility to use this broad-based categorical eligibility which allowed us to, to place certain families who met certain characteristics um, into the program. Um, um, and then also, we were able to do it in a more simplified manner by not having to look at some of their assets and some other um, areas of their eligibility. Um, Vermont, for at least the last 15 years, has taken advantage of the broad-based categorical eligibility provisions in the rule as do currently about 41 other states in the country. Um, the language being used to support um, this proposed rule at the federal level is that um, this has been a loophole in the federal rules for the last 20 years. Um, they've really been ingrained parts of the eligibility rules and are not loopholes that the majority of the states in this country avail themselves of this. So it will have a dramatic impact across the country. Um, uh, when it was rolled out, the, um, the administration indicated that it would affect about 8% of, of the SNAP households across the country. We analyzed the caseload in Vermont, and we believe it'll impact about 13% of Vermonters currently receiving the program right now in the documents. Um, we submitted um, uh, beforehand, uh, we believe about 5,200 of uh, cases right now our households will lose their eligibility for three squares Vermont. Um, thank you. Um, if, if this proposed rule is passed and becomes final in its current form, um, we believe that that will mean about 4,600 kids will lose um, um, eligibility for the program as, as well. And when we look at those cases currently and the benefits they receive, um, that, that will, Vermont will lose for those households about $7.5 million a year in three squares Vermont benefits for those households. Um, as you'll hear from other testimony today from <clears throat> um, other departments in state government and other community partners, um, the impacts go beyond um, the three squares Vermont program. Um, we provide regularly a certification list to the Agency of Education of all of the children receiving three squares Vermont benefits in Vermont, and then they are automatically eligible for free and reduced lunch in the state. So that means 4,600 kids will no longer be automatically and categorically eligible for free and reduced lunches. 
their parents or their or a caretaker will have to apply through the school for that benefit. And as a former school board member and chair, that's a difficult thing to have families do because they're sharing their personal financial information directly with the school. And we find that many kids who are eligible don't enroll just for that reason alone. And so we believe that, and I believe someone here is from the Agency of Education that can talk about the broader implications for the agency in terms of additional funding that is tied to the number of kids receiving free and reduced lunch from the state. So the impact will be quite broad beyond just the three squares per month program as well. So we've submitted some additional documents um, um, with this. We've um, we have helped to this one out. Um, I apologize. To give you a sampling of some of the households who will be impacted um, by this um, proposed rule, um, just so that you can understand the demographics of some of the Vermonters receiving the benefit and how this will impact them. This is a scenario um, from the first category you will see on that, on that um, memo. Um, and so this is a household um, with at least one member who was over age 60 or um, disabled and not eligible for the standard categorically um, eligibility provision. So they, they will lose eligibility under this proposed rule. Um, this is from an actual household that's been identified from our caseload, just to give you an example. So the household um, gross income for this household of, of two members is uh, almost $1,600 a month. Um, they have a mortgage of $405 a month. Um, their property taxes are $54 a month. Um, their out-of-pocket expenses, that um, medical expenses are $64 a month. And they have a savings account with just over $5,000. Under the proposed rule, we will now have to look at um, assets. Um, and a savings account is a countable asset. And so any assets over a certain dollar amount, I believe it's two. 3,500 if you have an elderly or disabled yep. person in the household, and 2,250 if there is not anyone elderly or disabled yep. in the household. So did you say, I'm sorry, did you yep. say that again? Sorry. Um, it's 3,500 if there is an elderly or disabled person in the household and 2,250 without. Thank you. And so this household currently receives a benefit of $212 a month. Under the proposed rule, they would lose all of their benefit and they would receive zero and they, and they would no longer be eligible for the, for the program. Question, what, what's yeah. counted as an asset? Is it just cash or uh, is it like car? Uh, you don't, get to that there's, uh, we provided a list of accountable resources under the SNAP program as well. It was on the table. Um, um, and so Thank you'll you. see the different assets that we do next time. Yeah. And there's a whole long list that we can provide as well of assets that are not counted. So. And then in scenario two, if you um, look, um, this is a household without um, one member who's over 60 and disabled, um, again. Um, yeah. um, and here we have a grandmother who um, is 71, living with her grandson who's age 10, so it's a caretaker case. Um, so, so the net income after deductions would not be able to exceed 100% of the federal poverty level for a household of two, that's $16,900 a year. So this household um, 
has um, income of 20, just over $2,500 a month. They have a mortgage of $350. Uh, they have property taxes of 71 They have a homeowner's insurance of 45 They have a savings account with $2,125. This household currently receives the minimum allotment allowable per month, which is $15 per month. However, the grandson would be eligible for free reduced lunch. Um, automatically, we would provide that information to the Agency of Education through, through our data exchange. Um, here, under the proposed rule, they would lose their eligibility and that they would need to apply directly through the school to continue to be eligible if they met. The, the criteria are different for free and reduced lunch than they are for the SNAP program, so not everyone, it's not a, a, a complete comparison. There are different requirements. And so some households that might be eligible for SNAP might not be eligible and vice versa. So you, you, it's a really fact-based determination that you look at each household individually. Then the child can actually have to apply. They yes, the family apply. would actually have to apply directly through the school um, to, to, to continue that benefit of free and reduced lunch. Um, and Sean, mm -hmm. um, just so that we have a scope of what that could mean for this household, the free and reduced lunch, if say it's totally gone, like say the grandmother does not get any assistance mm -hmm. for lunch for this child, what will that expense be like monthly for that child? I, I have a sense of it for my own child, but I, I don't know if you had like a figure for that. My sense is it could be up to $50 a month, if not a little more, based on the prices of, of meals in the schools. Right. My date is a little dated from when I was on the school board. Mm -hmm. okay. It's been a few years. But. Okay, mine is 75 a month yeah. for right. daily, for daily hot lunch. I think that when Rosie Kruger speaks, she can probably speak to yeah. that. Yes. Well, the, the actual estimate probably in her head. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Yes. Uh, Sean, another. Uh, maybe you're going to get to this later, but my recollection is that some folks who receive a nominal amount of SNAP benefits also, uh, by virtue of that, receive additional fuel assistance benefits, that there being a connection between fuel assistance and, and SNAP, the heat, heat of heat yes, uh, there is program. A, there is, is, a, is that in here somewhere? Are those um, folks um, in here somewhere? Because then what I'm assuming is that if those folks lose their SNAP benefits, they will then be eligible for lower fuel assistance benefits, so there's another ripple effect yes. of this in another yeah. program. Yeah, for, for um, households that um, receive SNAP, um, there's a provision um, in the federal SNAP rules that if someone receives LIHEAP, they can receive the full standard utility um, allowance off their income, which is about $730 a month even if their costs don't rise to that level. Um, so if someone, um, you know, so they receive more SNAP benefits for this as well. And if these households, um, you know, lose this, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna receive more LIHE benefits per se. So it, they could be, you know, depending on what happens, there could be an impact for those households as well. Um, and is there, um, is there, I'm trying to pull back in my memory, but is there a connection also between even receiving a minimal SNAP benefit and child care financial assistance program? I don't believe there's a direct correlation with that. There is a more direct correlation for the reach up program. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, um, moving to the third scenario. Uh, just to highlight, uh, you just kind of want to give the committee uh, the, um, a sense of how this will impact different households. Um, we have a member who's 37, they rent a room and a home. Um, uh, the savings account will make them ineligible for the program under the proposed rule. They have gross income of just over 1100 a month, room rent of $360, and they have uh, $3,300 in the bank. They currently receive a benefit of $139 a month and they were, would um, no longer be eligible for the program, and they would receive zero dollars a month. Um, even though um, they have um, a, a, a lower income that might make them eligible, in this scenario, their asset would make, th their savings account or bank account would make them ineligible for the program, whereas under the current rules, they would be eligible. Um, in the fourth scenario we have, we have a member, uh, two members who um, uh, married 
couple who are both 59 years old, the net income um, after deductions cannot exceed 100% of the federal poverty level. Um, for As we indicated before, that would be 16,910. Um, in this household, they have gross income of $1,725. They pay room rent of 300. They have a savings account of 957. Their current benefit um, is $15 a month, and they would lose their eligibility under the proposed rule. And they and it, the impact for this household would be much smaller than in the other examples, but it, there's an impact nonetheless. I will say, um, we're coming to the time of the year where we, every year there's a COLA change for the SNAP benefits. Um, they go in effect for um, October 1st. Um, several years ago, um, because of the way the economy and the cost of living index, benefits actually went down several dollars for households per month across the state, and we received a tremendous number of calls from distressed Vermonters on the program about how that little difference in benefit um, stretch their ability to make ends meet, whether it's paying for prescription drugs or being you know, being able to purchase food or, or other things in their household that they needed resources for. Fortunately, for the um, benefits that are going um, changing this October, the benefits are going back up to what they were several years ago. They're going up by a dollar or two, so that's good news for Vermont. But if this proposed rule comes to pass, for the 5,200 households that will be losing benefits will be a large impact. Sean, can you say a little bit more about um, the, or maybe somebody else is going to cover this, but the, um, the process, the federal process in terms of it's a proposed rule. Sure. Uh, what's the length of time between proposed public comment period, mm -hmm. uh, enactment, changes? I know it, uh, you know, the at different points, different things get proposed and then sure. they get changed and uh, sure. sometimes comment periods we send out. Yep. Um, so right now, um, this proposed rule was issued on July 24th. Um, it's open for public comment until September 23rd. And then at that point, um, they, uh, the administration needs to review and respond to all of the comments it receives. And then, then it's able to, after that point, to finalize and publish its rule. Also in the news lately, um, there, there was a, a final rule just um, issued that takes effect in several months um, for the public charge regarding um, Im immigration um, was published. And that was put out for comment probably nine months ago, I believe. And they received over 300,000 comments. So it took them about nine months to review, respond, to respond to those comments, and then issue a final rule. So that depending on, I think some of the time frame depends on the number of comments received um, for the administration to review and respond to. So. Sean, on this document, I'm just trying to reconcile, for instance, you say in this uh, scenario four, you have an average monthly benefit loss of 131.97, but then you pick out a particular couple and their benefit loss would only be 15. So that's true for some of them are higher, yeah, some of them are yeah, lower. Are lower yes. But yeah. that but that that, right. that average has been has been yeah, calculated by using everybody in that category. Yes, for the, those 665 households in uh -huh. that category, that would be the average benefit. Okay. So as with averages, some people are below that and some are above. I had to know it down the line as well as on the day change and uh, Representative Wood definitely has some other comments and good to get the dates. I, I noticed that those, um, this will happen before the legislature is back in session. So I don't know if there's any, res there's, is, I'm, I'm looking to ask me the question of what is Vermont's response? In this comment period, but as, as a state, are we taking any, yeah, so, any um, official response? Yes, we, as a department and an agency, our uh, human services are, are drafting our comments right now to respond. Um, and we will be um, sharing um, how negatively this will impact and, and um, urge them not to you know, finalize this rule and just to leave the, the program um, as it is currently. So in anticipation, it's not like you didn't have enough to do. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for working hard on this, and I kept, you know, discussing with this committee if there's a role 
for, for this committee to take in response to that? Sure. Sure. One thing I would point out, um, the Farm Bill was um, finalized in the last year or so, and it had been um, due to be re-upped for a while, and um, there was a you know, House passed version and the Senate version and then a compromise. Um, in the initial House version of the Farm Bill, that's now in effect, um, a, a similar change to what this rule does was proposed to, to actually change the program through that process, through the, through, through the legislative process with them, but it required a rule change as well to comply with the rule. Um, the version that came out of the Senate didn't include um, this proposed change in it, and actually the final version did not as well. And so if the legislative intent was to keep the program at the federal level as it was, so this rule kind of conflicts with what the Farm Bill did. So just it. follow up with one and then I'll yeah. let you continue. And we've got a lot, there's a lot that everybody needs to respond to is, um, I think what deepens my concern is that this is a proposed rule change mm -hmm. and it's not like a part of a budget proposal that's going to go through mm -hmm. the Congress. This is not going to need to go through no. the U.S. Congress. And um, which for me carries a, a much more higher success rate of this rule change and passing. So it's been, so we're hearing today and there's a period for us to understand the impacts of the world. Thanks for your hard work. Okay. Um, <laughs> in the fi final scenario, scenario five, um, uh, we have a, a, a mom and an infant daughter. Uh, their gross income cannot exceed 130% of the federal poverty level. Also, uh, two, um, 130% of the FPL is uh, just under 22,000. Um, for this household, they have a gross income of 2,286. Um, their rent is 514, so they receive some sort of rental subsidy. Um, they have a dependent care cost of $336 a month, and they have $80 um, in, in a savings account. They currently receive $127 a month. This family um, would no longer be eligible. They would be over income, and um, they would receive um, they would receive no benefit. So Sean, how, I mean, on this type of resources that are countable, do you currently ask all of these yes. questions? Yes. Yes. So you ask people if they have a snowmobile yeah. or what is yeah. more yeah. this? Yeah, we're required that to, to, to verify that, and to require that and verify it as well. And, and so, so do you anticipate having to make any changes in the questioning, or how, how do you redo this? Do you go back and review the stuff, or will everyone have to, um, you'll have to relook at the information that you already yeah, have. Our processes will have to change because currently, um, under, under the current, we don't need to look at assets. And so, um, for, for the, for the uh, broad based categorical eligibility households, and so, um, you know, for moving forward, if we have to consider assets, we'll have to, look, we'll have to collect all that. But you said you already collect this information. Some of it we do because we, we're required to, others we don't because of, of the broad based categorical eligibility. Uh, so thank you for this um, really disturbing information. Um, a couple of questions and then also just a, a, a comment. One is on the list of types of county resources at the bottom, it says vehicles unless excluded. Um, and I know you've got a different list of what might be excluded, but can we assume that somebody's vehicle that's needed for work that may be over the asset limit is, is excluded? Um, so the the asset test for vehicles is we allow one vehicle per household. Unless you've got a youth that's also working, right? With this, with this, under this test, it's one vehicle per household unless its only use is a work vehicle. So if you had a second vehicle that was a work vehicle or a farm vehicle, that could also be excluded, but primarily it's one vehicle per household is excluded. Uh, and do you folks have, I mean, You've got numbers of households affected and the average monthly benefit loss. Do you have a tally for, let's just say, the legislature had plenty of money rolling around. How much would it cost to replace the federal dollars? Just a, a broad number of things. When we looked at the, 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 the households here on this, on this that, that would fall into this proposed rule and would lose their benefits for the, for the prior month that we had data available, it was 
five million dollars. If, if, if you calculate it out for the annual, year, that annualized, annualized, yes, it would be seven point five million dollars. That doesn't count on any additional administrative. Right. That's right. Or some of the ripple effects, ripple like, like uh, school right. lunches, or well, also does that include school we lunches? receive um, an administrative match to to administer the program from um, the federal government, and it's at at fifty percent match. So for for every dollar we spend, we get 50 cents back as reimbursement from the federal government. Because, and the benefit is all 100% federal benefit. That's the other thing I would stress. Um, and then for the admin piece, we get 50 cents on the dollar back. If, if, um, we, run, if we were to run a state-based program, we would have to cost allocate our time differently and track it, and, and so there would be an expense to administer a state-based supplemental food program that we don't have now running Federal, solely federal based program. So the seven and a half million dollars is literally to replace the benefits. The benefits that doesn't take into a cost the other administrative cost and, and system cost. We would need to reprogram our, our eligibility system to run a separate, I'm assuming parallel system, but you know, those details would have to be worked out. And, and so, Madam Chair, um, I, I guess. Also, to Sean's point about um, <clears throat> comments and what happened with the uh, other regulatory change that you were referring to is, I believe, the public charge um, issue for, um, for, for uh, immigrant families, which um, there were literally, I, I think, it was several hundred thousand uh, comments. And so this is a situation where quantity of comments is very, very important because it delays, because, as Sean pointed out, um, the feds have to read all those and respond to all those. The more comments that go in, um, the longer it takes them to do that. So uh, I'll be prepared to offer a motion at some appropriate point today that the council um, submit, that we ask the Ledge Council to submit or draft up comments on our behalf, uh, but I would also individually say that each of us individually um, for the organizations that we represent uh, and possibly even as individual uh, citizens should be submitting uh, comments. They can be the same comments. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be a lot different uh, quantity matters in these situations. Yes, yeah, thank you. I'll take it. So I think in the interest of time, if you're finished, we'll thank move on. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so, Tessie Wilder from the Vermont Actual School. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to be pretty short and sweet here, and I do. Um, supply any handouts or written testimony in advance. So, um, just to just going to summarize a few of our comments from Vermont After School. My name is Cassie. I am the communications coordinator at Vermont After School, and we are a statewide nonprofit um, working to increase access and quality of programs during the out-of-school time hours for kids and youth across Vermont. Um, my executive director, Holly Morehouse, couldn't be here today, so um, she sends her regrets, and I'm here now. So, Vermont After School is deeply opposed to the Trump administration's proposed cuts to SNAP or three squares BT. Um, it's clear it's a key strategy in addressing hunger and food insecurity in Vermont, and we are particularly focused on the impacts that the cuts will have on children and youth, um, both in school and during out of school time hours. And as Deputy Commissioner Brown mentioned, it's the um, potential impact on the free and reduced rate. Um, in schools that I think is kind of triggering some alarm bells for us. Um, when you move potentially, um, well, I'll back to it a little bit. As he mentioned, over 4,600 children live in households in Vermont that are expected to lose benefits under this proposal. And um, that means that those children are at risk of losing access to free meals at school because three squares makes families automatically eligible for free breakfast and lunch at school. So if they lose the three square benefits, then they'll have to apply for the school, as he mentioned, and that's a real um, headache. It's for families. Um, it can be a barrier to fill out the application. They also might not be fully eligible anymore. Um, it's also a huge headache for school administration to have to have more um, applications. 
but really, if the school, so if we're seeing potentially free and reduced rate, um, free and reduced rates of lunch at schools going down, so less kids are um, qualifying, that means less kids are getting access to you know, healthy snacks and meals at school, and it also means um, that there's some implications for some fun federal funding sources for out-of-school time meals. Um, so this is really concerning and problematic um, from our organization's viewpoint. The first is after-school snacks, and I'm sure um, Rosie with the Agency of Education can speak a little bit more about these funding sources as well, because um, they are federal funding sources that come through um, I think it's called the Child and Adult Care Food Program. So to qualify programs for these after-school snack reimbursements, they have to be 50% um, free and reduced lunch or higher. Um, same with summer meals. So we have you know, a lot of awesome free summer meal sites that aren't just at schools around Vermont. They're at libraries, rec centers, summer learning programs. Um, any nonprofit can apply and um, hopefully get funding, but they have to demonstrate, again, that 50% free and reduced rate or higher in their specific area where they're going to serve their meals. Um, and then another um, really concerning one that would be just pretty devastating is the um, 21st Century Community Learning Center grant eligibility. Uh, 21st Century Community Learning Center grant is a federal funding source for after school and summer learning programs. It's a um, Probably our, our, it is our biggest source of funding for after school and summer programs in Vermont, about $5 million a year. Um, communities have to, and schools have to be 50, sorry, 40% free and reduced rate or higher. Um, and often we've seen is in small communities, you know, it doesn't take a lot of kids to change that number. It can be 10 kids in a school can drop that number below the 40% and then they're no longer eligible for that um, after school and summer learning funding source. Um, in some, this cut would have a really, uh, really negative impact on our Vermont kids and youth, um, particularly during out of school time hours. Uh, we often say these after school snacks and meals and summer snacks and meals are so crucial because that can be the last chance that a kid might have access to healthy food before they go home and then before they come back to school in the morning for a healthy breakfast. Um, and the same in summer. That's a whole day that they might be counting on for a healthy snack, um, a healthy meal, like lunch and supper. So I really greatly appreciate you considering um, how this would impact kids during the out-of-school time hours when they're not at home, um, when they're at after-school programs, summer running programs, when they're at camp, um, when they're at uh, before-school programs. Etc. Um, teen centers, libraries, all of these are places where kids get food in our communities and really depend on that access. Any questions? Yes, just a quick one um, in follow up to what Earhart was mentioning earlier in terms of volume matters. So, is your organization anticipating uh, submitting written comments? Absolutely. Um, and also, Sending out on our um, a humble <laughs> social media world, <laughs> um, sharing it through that as well. Hunger Free is a um, long-standing partner of ours, and we're really supporting this work as best we can. And that was a great thank you for reminding us all of that as individuals and or as organizations. It's key. Any other questions? Thank you very thank much. You. <coughs> Ready for all. You do data. <laughs> so to answer that question, I'm sorry, I'm Rosie Kruger. I'm the State Director of Child Nutrition Programs at the Agency of Education. Um, to answer that question that was asked earlier about um, the benefit that that family might lose in terms of um, the free and reduced meals that they get at school. Uh, the average uh, lunch cost in Vermont, um, or the price charged to students, is about $3 per day, and the average breakfast charge is about $1.50. So in total, that's $4.50 per day, um, $90 uh, per month if school is in session, or about $810 per school year per student. So um, 
I think you know you've heard that um, the Agency of Education gets information from the Department for Children and Families about those 4,000 um, some odd students who or, or children who um, are in families. Um, I'm sorry <laughs> about. We get information from DCF um, about um, the children who are in families receiving three squares Vermont. Um, and we actually get information on about 17,750 students that way. Um, those are school age students that we're getting that information on. And DCF's numbers are on students ages 0 to 18. So it's a little bit tricky to parse out exactly um, what the impact is going to be. Um, but we know that of those 17, that, that um, it's going to, that 4,600 4, um, students who are going to be uh, no longer receiving benefits, um, sorry, um, it's a big impact. Um, 3,000, man, I'm sorry, I'm so nervous okay. today. This is <laughs> It's a really important issue. Um, So you've got some numbers in front of you. Um, we get information from DCF. Um, and we use that information to directly certify kids for free meals. Um, we send that information to the schools. And the schools, instead of requesting um, families apply for those um, free and reduced meal benefits, uh, the school tells the family you're automatically qualified. So it reduces that paperwork burden, as you've heard already. Um, when families are directly certified, we're able um, to, um, to, we don't have to, I'm really sorry. I need to pull it together for a second. So, um, when the families are directly certified, they're counted in the number of kids who are, are free, qualified for free and reduced meals. Um, in Vermont, we have about 330, 33,600 um, students who qualify for free and reduced meals. Now, the, the kids who um, we get the information from DCF who are directly certified by DCF, um, those kids count towards um, <laughs> the identified student percentage um, that a school can use to participate in the community eligibility provision. The community eligibility provision is a um, provision that allows for universal school meals. So all, school, all the school meals in the school are um, provided to all students at no charge. Um, if a school has 40% or more of their students who are directly certified, then they are eligible to participate in the community eligibility provision. Um, and that, um, the, the total kids who are directly certified, um, many, most of them, um, are directly certified because of their participation in three squares per month. Um, we get some additional kids who are directly certified for other reasons, um, such as um, they're participating in um, TANF or, or Reach Up Vermont, or their families are state-based foster, or um, they're uh, receiving services under the Migrant Education Program, or uh, Homeless Runaway Youth Act, or some other, other reasons. But the, the vast majority are because they're um, receiving SNAP benefits, or, or three squares per month. Um, when a school uh, has at least 40% of their kids who are directly certified, not a free and reduced rate of 40%, then uh, they can offer the community eligibility provision. And um, under that provision, we take their percentage of directly certified students, so say 40%, and we multiply that by 1.6, and we um, allow them to claim that number of meals, that percentage of meals for free, um, and the federal government pays for all those meals. Um, but the school has to pay for the remaining share of meals from non-federal funds. When a school's um, percentage of directly certified students gets up to about 62%, then all of the meals um, that they serve to students are uh, reimbursed at the free rate, and there's no, no uh, local funds that have to be contributed. Usually the local funds are general funds, but there could be other sources of funding, such as private donations or um, uh, 
a la carte sales or, or profits from other um, activities that they're, they're doing. So we're very concerned because we know that there is going to be a drop in the number of kids who are directly certified for, for free meals. We don't know if it's going to be the whole 4,600 number um, because, again, that's 0 to 18. We're only looking at school-aged children. But it will be some amount of those kids who are no longer directly certified, and there's no way to directly certify them. So there are going to be a number of schools who are um, no longer even eligible to participate in the program. You're not going to hit that 40% threshold. And there will be other schools who would have been um, eligible at a higher rate. Their, their um, directly certified rate might be up around 62%. Um, and as that drops, their local funds that they're going to have to contribute are going to increase. Um, this year, this past school year, we had 63 Vermont schools who were participating in the community eligibility provision. And even without this change, 14 of them had to drop this upcoming year because they either no longer hit that 40% threshold or they were right at the threshold and um, it was just going to be too much of a local contribution and it wasn't going to make economic sense for the school. Um, so even without you know, this impact, we're already seeing folks having to drop off that program. And so we know that there will be an impact on the community eligibility provision and um, and that's going to be, we're not sure of the extent, but we will certainly see an impact there, um, whether it's schools having to drop off the program completely or um, local, an increase in required local contributions. So we're sure of that. Where we're not sure what the impact will be, um, where, where we suspect there will be an impact, is on our overall free and reduced percentages. Um, and so um, those, those directly certified students, um, again, they, Families don't need to submit an application. Um, in looking at the numbers, it seems like if those families do submit an application, many of them will qualify for reduced price meals, um, which in Vermont, the state pays for the reduced price share of the meals. Um, we pay 40 cents for the lunches and 30 cents for the, the breakfast, which would have, in other states, um, that is charged to the families. So, those families that still qualify for reduced price meals, they themselves won't necessarily see a bill, but the state will see a bill for those students. Um, and this is not in your written testimony. Um, I looked through the numbers, and it looked like about 2,000 of those students um, were somewhere between 130% of federal poverty and 185% of federal poverty. And those are the students who would qualify at the reduced rate, and the state would need to pay for their share. If all of those kids are school-aged, and again, they're probably not, but if all of them were school-aged, um, and we multiply, we say 70 cents a day, so 30 cents for breakfast and 40 cents for lunch for 180 school days, that's a state-level uh, contribution of a little under $300,000. Um, so there is some impact there to the state as well. Um, that's kind of the best case scenario, that all those families say, oh, I'm not getting the, the SNAP benefits anymore. Um, I'm going to go ahead and apply for free and reduced meals, and I'm going to get the benefits. Um, and in that case, you know, we might not see it, a real hit to the free and reduced rates statewide, um, even though we will see that hit to schools who can participate in the community eligibility provision. Um, but we suspect that many families won't apply uh, for some of the reasons that were stated earlier. Um, their family doesn't feel comfortable submitting that, that app location. Um, often it's, you know, just to the, the school administrator um, in their local school, they know them, they might feel uncomfortable submitting the information. Um, maybe they would have felt more comfortable submitting it to the more anonymous, um, you know, caseworker through, through DCF. Um, so if those families don't apply, um, then we're going to see it hit to our free and reduced number statewide. Um, and know that number, um, we use that as a metric for student poverty in all kinds of programs. So we use it within the child nutrition programs. You heard already um, that um, the after school meals through the child and adult care food program, in order to offer those meals to all, or in order to offer that program, which offers um, after school snacks and after school suppers, the school has to have a free and reduced rate of at least 50%. Um, in order to offer that, that open meal site for the summer meals program, again, the school or the community needs to have a free and reduced percentage of at least 50%. So those are programs where our communities just will not be eligible if there's a drop 
um, in, in our green reduced rates. Um, and in our small little towns, it could just be a couple of kids who change that, that percentage. Um, if you have a 100 student school, we're just talking a few kids. Um, so it could have you know, a big impact on our ability to offer those, those school meals programs and those child, um, child nutrition programs. And then it could have an impact far beyond that um, in the education sphere generally. Um, again, we use those free and reduced rates as a proxy for student poverty throughout. Um, and it's everything from the E-rate program, um, which provides uh, technology grants. Um, those are the amount of money that schools get is based on their free and reduced percentage. Um, eligibility to participate in the low the teacher loan repayment program for low-income schools. Again, that's based on your community's free and reduced percentage. Um, and we also use free and reduced percentages as a um, metric for student poverty um, when we're comparing uh, how schools are, are doing um, under ESSA, um, the Every Student Succeeds Act. That's one of the things that we take into account. And folks at AOE are pretty concerned about how we're going to compare education data year over year and see improvements if there's suddenly this weird, fluky piece of, of something that has nothing to do with what's actually going on in the school. It's just about eligibility. Um, and so your free and reduced information across years will, will jump, and it won't reflect an actual change that happened on the ground. Um, and, or, and so it's going to make that data pretty difficult to use and, and to, to be useful. Um, so again, we're not sure, you know, best case scenario, all these families apply and the state just has to pay um, a few hundred thousand dollars more a year um, in, in reduced meal costs. But worst case scenario, these families don't apply or for some reason they might not qualify. Um, and then we're seeing a hit not only to the child nutrition programs, um, and not just to those families within the child nutrition programs, but again, all of those um, all of those other kids who attend those schools who benefit from those programs, um, but also throughout our, our education system. Thank you for thank you for coming because we need we need you know we've been off on summer and say but you're the front line you're the one that's feeling it every day and so we start to feel so don't feel like the emotional part is there. Trust me, we've got enough senators and house members that go cry in the co-room uh, often enough because we uh, are a part of the communities as well. And when you see the front line and the impacts it has, it's very personal. So let me just, let me ask you another question. Sure. Or that was another question. Sometimes, some people think, what if we just had food, breakfast, and lunch in schools all in Vermont? just do it. Do we have an idea of what that would cost? We do, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> it's not a good answer for you. Um, we went through this um, with the, the Senate um, Agriculture Committee this spring was actually really interested in this. Um, we would make the assumption that um, if meals were free for all kids, that families would not be inclined to submit those income applications. Just, you know, um, well, so the way that we could pay for those, the only way that we have at the federal level to pay for those meals is by following the, the federal child nutrition programs. Um, and so, you know, we, we get a significant amount of federal funding to pay for those programs um, based on kids submitting those income applications. So we made the calculation that um, if, we, if we offer meals for free to all the kids um, under the federal child nutrition programs, um, we need to come up with the, the share of non-federal funding. It's, it's allowed, um, but we have to come up with non-federal funding to pay for those paid meals. Um, and we could still directly certify kids so that you know, those, um, the, the kids who are um, directly certified through SNAP um, and through those other means, they, we'd still be able to claim them as free, but assuming that no family is submitted submitted income applications. We kind of did the numbers based on that, and it would cost the state about $50 million if every kid ate every day. Um, so it's- so Five zero? Five zero. So it's- so, And that's breakfast and lunch? Yeah. So it's a big number. Um, it's certainly- 
something to work towards. Um, but but it's There's bigger numbers than this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing there again, we're concerned that um, if those families are no longer applying, um, then again, our, our free and reduced rates are going to drop. We're going to drop just to the kids who are directly certified through their, their other participation. Um, and so we need to come up with some other way of, of getting that income information. Um, and that's sort of, I think, where the Senate committee ended up directing their resources to try and figure out is there a way to get tax data or is there a way to get some other um, data so that we can have replacement um, income information to use for this. Thank you. Um, so this, referencing the 15 schools that had to drop out. 14. Or 14. Um, what is the population? I don't have that off the top of my head. In locations? All over the state. A lot in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, okay. Thank you. But there are some all over the state. Um, I do, I have a list that I can supply after. So most of the 14 are from the Northeast Kingdom are no longer eligible? They yeah, um, so it's, a, it's done on a, a four year cycle. And so their numbers four years ago were high, and now they're not. Um, so some of them are no longer eligible to participate at all. Some of them could participate, but the share of local funding would just be so high that it's not doable. Is it safe to say that that's where the greatest need is in some of these schools? Uh, I mean, the. The way CEP is supposed to work is that it's available to the schools where there's the greatest need. Um, but. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I'm Janet Hilbert from the Health Department, and I just have a question about. Um, and first, thank you so much for talking about the broader implications of the ripple effects across education. Sure. Which I think even may not we may not be able to quantify the behavioral impacts of kids who are hungry and, and, and aren't able to attend or listen as well because they're hungry. Absolutely. Um, is there a way to figure out, or do you have the fund, the a fund, a dollar amount for if we got the federal fund share? If there were a way to get the family income applications completed, do you know what that figure is? So we have 15 million. It would cost to Vermont. Would we? We're able to retain, ideally, that federal subsidy through getting that paperwork completed. You know, so, if the families who currently qualify yes. through applications, if we're able to convince them to yes. still submit applications, yes. I don't know offhand. Um, so, our free and reduced rate statewide is about 41%. So, we would need to come up with a paid share of the the 39. Sorry. Uh, Math, 59% <laughs> um, of those meals. So uh, it's a lot still. It's still a lot. Yeah. Um, and another, just another question. Is there a way to require that application be completed as part no. of No. The federal regulations specifically say that we cannot require families to complete the applications. And it has to be filled out every year correctly? Yeah. Correct? And yes. not everybody to school with their child the first day to fill out that. Well, it doesn't have to, it can be done at any point throughout the year. Even if you send it home, it doesn't always But come yes, back. for sure. Typically, it does not come back. So it would be time and cost prohibitive to go around trying to find every family that didn't fill out an application. Well, thank you. Yearly, because it has to be done every year. Well, thank you so much. For sure. Move on to uh, Mary Woodruff from Dale. So Mary's testimony is written here and is also uploaded onto the committee website. I'll hand it off. Um, or even it's also there.
Hello. I'm Mary Woodruff, and I'm from the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, and I'm the State Unit on Aging Operations Team Leader. And um, I'm here on behalf of my director, Angela Smith James, who's taking a well deserved vacation. And I hope she's doing something fun today. <laughs> Although I know she would really enjoy being here because she's very passionate about older Vermonters and individuals with disabilities. Um, I manage food and nutrition programs at Dale. And those include the nutrition programs through the Older Americans Act, which is federally funded, through our state-funded um, Home Delivered Meals Program for individuals with disabilities under age 60, and our federally funded Commodity Supplemental Food Program and Senior Farmer Market, Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program. And I work with really talented community partners, VCIL, the Area Agencies on Aging, the Vermont Food Bank, and Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont. Um, we work very closely with DCF as well and use a lot of the data that they've provided to you and to us to increase outreach for three squares so that more older Vermonters and individuals with disabilities can take advantage of this benefit. Um, the current three squares Vermont caseload is nearly 50% of older adults and individuals with disabilities. And this um, proposal will impact, according to DCF, an estimated 2,385 households. Um, and those are households that have at least one member that's over 60. And when I refer to older or minor or older adult, that's somebody that's over 60, um, or that's a household with somebody with, that has a disability, and it will impact nearly 5,000 individuals. So when you look at the average benefits for older Vermonters and individuals with disabilities, the monthly benefit ranges from $141 to $186 a month. And this is a big benefit. This provides them with the funds they need to eat the food they need to manage their health, to pay for medicine, heat, rent, transportation. The benefit for older Vermonters comes through as cash as well. So they have that opportunity to spend the benefit on what they need to stay healthy and well. And we see this um, proposal rippling through the other services and supports that our partners and that we provide um, and impacting the healthcare system, the economy, and our, our communities. We've also seen in the last few years a growing number of grandparents that care for grandchildren. And so this would be a double whammy for those people. They lose the three squares benefit as well as the loss of school meals. And these are grandparents that are living on fixed incomes and wouldn't have the room to find how to make up for this loss of benefit. Within the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, we have a division of voc vocational rehab. And in that division, they've done a lot of work in recent years to help high school students transition to the work world. These students, too, would be impacted through the loss of school meals, and they face already a number of barriers in becoming successfully employed in our state. The real impact will be at the local level for our providers in the Aging Services Network that take calls, that provide um, referral to other resources and services, that provide community and home delivered meals and case management. And they're, they're already stressed. Um, and we see that there's no place and within our department to fill this gap that will be created and that our partners will um, see increased stress on their resources and staff. I think that DCF provided some really great data um, to help us paint this picture, um, but the real impact certainly won't be seen until if, if and when this proposed rule goes into effect. Any questions? I, I did want to ask a general question, and I see Sean's gone, but maybe somebody else can ask this. Um, is the state, has the state sent out some kind of a link for uh, being able to respond or 
um, um, for public comment or if that could be circulated among us, that would be great and we can get it out to our organizations as well. Yeah, no, we're so Does it exist? has it. If you scroll ahead to Hunger Free's materials, they have a whole array of information. Um, and we're going to hear from them next. Um, yes. Uh, so I'm just curious, and this is, I guess, um, both for DCF and for Dale. Um, has there been any sort of, I guess, what you might call preliminary notification to current recipients of uh, this pending uh, potential benefit change? I'll go for it in the poll. DCF has not done that. It is still just a proposed comment, and it's our proposed rule. And we would be afraid of households not applying if they don't meet those asset thresholds, and we don't want that to happen prematurely. Yeah. Right. And I guess I'm talking about the people who are already receiving, so they've already applied and they are receiving. Um, it's, uh, I'm just I'm thinking about more is better, um, try, trying to um, prepare people, but also trying to get their uh, active voices being heard as recipients. Yeah, so, sometimes what happens for older Vermonters is any discussion of a rule, whether it will be good or bad, sometimes just keeps people away from applying um, because they don't know exactly what it is. It's the unknown, and that will keep people from reaching out for that help. And that and that's also makes confusion on the service provision level is having outreach workers you know, be able to clearly understand and ex be able to explain to potential applicants exactly what will happen. So, um, can I follow up? Just, um, so this is more directed at Dale because you do your work through community partners. Um, so what kind of information have you provided to community partners like the, the AAAs and um, adult aids and you know, <coughs> They were invited to a meeting convened by DCF to talk about the proposal um, and to hear firsthand about what DCF is doing. And we plan to continue to discuss this, especially with the Area Agencies on Aging. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, Member Freak Vermont, uh, Under Warren Horton, and Drake Turner. For the record, I'm Anor Horton, the Executive Director of Hunger Free Vermont. And my name's Drake Turner. I'm the Food Security Advocacy Manager at Hunger Free Vermont. Just a guy trying to get a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Nate. Don't be friendly. Pay no attention to their business. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I want to thank the Council for convening this really important meeting on this very distressing um, topic, but it is really critical for all of us to um, gather the knowledge and data that we can to um, really get clear about what the impacts of this devastating proposed rule change would be for Vermonters, and um, we certainly have been getting devastated by that information for the last um, hour. Um, so we're here to talk about um, the campaign um, uh, and resources that um, we need all Vermonters to get involved in and also um, our state government. So um, first I want to thank the Agency of Human Services, the Agency of Education, um, our federal delegation, all of our state legislators and our community partners. Everyone's been mobilizing very quickly and shown real commitment to communication and collaboration around this rule. Uh, we've been working with Representative Ann Pugh in addition to get data out to all legislators about the situation. Um, and we've, we've been hearing from many legislators and we know that um, our state 
government is working hard to um, try to address this threat to Three Squares Vermont. So we're really grateful for um, everyone's concern and quick action. Um, I want to underline just a couple of um, things that were uh, mentioned by other people who spoke. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Drake to um, give you a really quick tour of our um, public comment submission campaign webpage um, and the resources that we have. And then we'll, of course, also any questions along the way, we're happy to take. Um, I think it's important to really underline um, the, the chilling effect that these changes, should they be implemented, and even the media around them um, are having and will have on um, people choosing to take the step of identifying themselves as being in need of food assistance and applying for Three Squares Vermont and um, school meals, you know, the supplies to as well. Um, because part of the, um, I believe that part of the entire agenda behind this proposed rule change, and it's a, one in a series, of, as others have already noted, of threats to SNAP that have um, been taking place under this federal administration, um, is to make the programs so stigmatized and make them so confusing and make them so um, difficult to use that people stop using them. And we certainly have already seen that this has been happening um, even though the change around um, public charge has not actually been implemented yet. Um, families that fear that they might be, um, might face consequences under this, might have their opportunity to apply for citizenship threatened, uh, are simply pulling out of all of the federal programs already. Um, and of course, this is then having devastating impacts on their children um, who are U.S. citizens already in most cases. Um, and on their ability to continue to thrive in this country and contribute and establish themselves here. So um, that's, I, I predict that that will happen again um, should these rule changes go into effect and that in fact even the media attention around the rule changes, which is necessary and yet it produces a chilling effect and it's probably producing a chilling effect already. Um, in, in who is applying. So um, we've got to both fight the rule change and fight against the stigma that um, is being attached to these programs, which are, after all, programs that we all may need and programs that everyone's tax dollars have paid for. Um, so I'll just say that. And then I think, um, I think that everyone else who's come before in this hearing have, has ably spoken about the data and the consequences and the ripple effects. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Drake and um, let's talk about what we can do because this fight is nowhere near over yet. So Drake, take it away. Thanks, Anwar. Thank you, everyone. Um, so again, Anwar you know, has, has mentioned a lot and other folks in the room have really spoken to the impact that this rule could have on, on people in our communities. Um, Hunger Free Vermont has been working on, on getting our arms around what this rule could mean um, since it was announced. I mean, we've you know, been lucky enough to work with our partners at the state to figure out exactly what that impact is. Um, so this week, we're officially launching our advocacy campaign um, to encourage folks to speak out as well. Um, as folks have mentioned, you know, this is a public comment period before um, the administration can make any changes. You know, all Americans have a right to have their voice heard. Um, and although it, it can be a little bit frustrating to, to think that, that perhaps this could go into effect even amidst a lot of opposition, um, we really want to get the word out as strongly as possible. Um, so we have two main goals of this advocacy campaign. One is really to get the word out to folks that if 
they qualify for this program to continue to apply and to continue to participate. Um, you know, it really remains to be seen how long this process can take. Um, and Anor really highlighted the fact that there's a lot of confusion out there. A lot of folks are, are uh, really uncertain as to whether or not they're eligible, whether or not their benefits are going to be taken away. Um, I've heard from community partners and, you know, directly from Vermonters who are just feeling a lot of uncertainty. Um, so we want to be sure to get the word out that this is still a program, um, that nothing has changed yet. Folks can still apply and, and remain on the program and that, um, that they have the right to make that decision for themselves and their families. Um, you know, likely if there is a change to be made, it will not happen for many months, as others have mentioned. Um, and we're really hopeful that we can prevent this from happening in the first place. So we want folks to still have confidence in Three Scores Vermont as a resource for themselves. Um, and the other main goal of, of this, this advocacy campaign is to make sure that Vermont has as strong voice as possible in submitting comments. Um, so you have in your packets an action alert that we've created. This is so that folks can share. Um, this with as many people out in the community as possible. Um, and we also have on our website here a lot of resources to help folks share comments. Um, so without, thank you, Anar. Um, public, the public comment period, as we mentioned, goes through September 23rd. Um, folks can submit comments as individuals, Erhard was mentioning this before, as individuals as, and on behalf of organizations, coalitions, committees, there are a lot of different ways that Vermonters group together <laughs> on different issues. Um, so there really is a lot of potential for um, really strong comments to come from our community. Um, and we've done a lot and we'll continue to do a lot to, to share resources with folks to make that as easy um, a task as possible. So we on our website um, as of this week have some template language for folks. So we have um, a template that's for individual comments as well as for organizational comments that folks can adapt. Um, one thing I do want to mention is that we really um, are committed to having as, you know, volume is really important, so the more comments the better, um, but they also need to be in your own voice um, for a comment to count as unique. It needs to be, the, the general thinking is at least 30% distinct. Um, so in our template language, we have different sections where folks can add you know, their own thoughts about the impact, the impact on their clients, what folks do. Um, it doesn't need to take, you know, a super long amount of time, but it is important to, to have your comments be in your own voice as much as possible. Um, and we also have a lot of outreach language on the website that, that we're providing to folks to help spread the word uh, through social media, through emails, front porch forum, all the different ways that we communicate with one another. Um, and I also just want to share a couple of reasons that we want as many comments as possible. Um, the first, I think, as, as folks have mentioned, is that um, you know, a large volume of comments expresses a lot of opposition to rules like this. The public charge proposal that has um, been finalized now, um, there was significant opposition to that rule. And in the final rule, um, the Department of Homeland Security had to concede that there was strong opposition to that rule in the final ruling. Um, and I think partially as a result of having hundreds of thousands of comments, um, there are now a lot of legal challenges to this rule. So again, this is a rule that is not in effect yet. Um, it's scheduled to go into effect in October, but Vermont is part of a lawsuit, um, and there are many other states that are, are suing to stay the implementation of that rule. Um, so it's important right now to voice your opposition to rules like this. Um, the more comments there are, the longer it takes to, to sift through them, and it's also a really strong um, voice on the other side of things. Um, I think it helps focus public attention on an issue like this, and it also may be helpful in the future um, to have as many voices as possible. Is it time for questions? Sure, if you have a question. Could, could you uh, go over the legalities and the procedure? This is the administrative procedure stuff, right? Yes. Okay. So how does how do these comments apply? We're, we're not likely to change the administration's mind. I doubt that any bureaucrat is going to raise, oh, gee, I never thought of that. They're right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but neither do our comments compel. And they have administrative discretion. Does, do the comments affect court cases? Or, I mean, just, just what, mm -hmm. how does this work? I'm not so familiar with, with the legalities around that and how this comment, the comment periods work. I don't know if you have any Yeah, response. so um, so you're right. So the comments don't compel, and we certainly aren't going to change, uh, we aren't going to cause reform among 
the members of the Trump administration who've been gunning for SNAP since the very beginning of their time in office. But we might cause them to decide that there's so much political opposition, including among their own base, that they choose not to implement. So that has happened with some other proposed administrative rule changes. So, you know, that's a possibility. Are we hanging our hopes on that? No. But the, the volume of comments does have significance in the court cases that certainly will follow, in particular in convincing whatever judge, federal judge, gets this challenge to stay the implementation until the court case is decided. And that's all we need to do, I hope. Um, because delay is the name of the game in terms of keeping this rule from getting implemented. That's my next question. What, what, is, what is the game plan? What do we do with that? First, how long are we likely to be able to delay that it's very It's impossible for me to answer that question because it depends on whether the judges hearing the lawsuits that will certainly be brought choose to stay the implementation while the lawsuits are being heard. It, I mean, I, I just can't answer that question. But because administrative rule change does not go through any kind of legislative process, this is the only avenue that we have, well, in addition to going into the streets, and perhaps that will be the next thing we propose. Uh, but for now, this is the strategy that has the best chance of slowing down implementation long enough to make it irrelevant. To make it what? To make, to make, to make it that implementation will never happen. So you're talking about delaying until after the next election? Correct. I think it's also important to note that this rule in particular, as folks mentioned earlier, was considered and then left out of the farm bill that was voted on by Congress. So there is, um, you know, this has been decided on by a, by a body that was elected by, you know, Americans. And so the fact that the um, administration is trying to enact it through administrative action, um, there's a very strong case to be made that that's subverting the will of Congress, who's a democratically elected body. Um, which I think also is something that would come into effect, uh, into play if and when this proceeds. Yeah. Were you finished with your yeah. presentation? Oh, sorry. Um, sorry but. Well, I think Anwar, I, so our, our ask for, for the council and for um, other folks here and, and other folks um, in the legislature is to, to submit comments um, as individuals on behalf of the council um, as well as you know, in any other form you um, can imagine, and we are you know we have a lot of resources here. We're developing more, um, and we're happy to work with anyone who wants more talking points, more information, um, or any assistance in submitting comments. We're linking to a comment portal that's managed by the Food Research Action Center, which is a, a national anti-hunger organization. Um, and it's a, a very easy way of submission, but there are other options as well. Um, so we are here to assist anyone. Um, and thank you for, for hearing from us and for your attention to this issue. And I think Anwar has another. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just to follow up to your previous um, set of uh, responses mm -hmm. to the question. So uh, are you aware whether there is um, a national hunger free plan or um, a concerted effort that if it gets far enough down the pike that there would be national um, lawsuits filed, so not just leaving at the state level? Mm -hmm. but yeah, there are organized sort of uh, nuclear option plan that, that Yeah, sorry. Um, there are, we've been working very closely with national partners, um, FRAC, the Food Research Action Center, and Feeding America, which is the uh, national organization that does a lot of the charitable food work, um, have been doing webinars. There's also a group called the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities that's been doing a lot of research. Um, so anti-hunger groups across the U.S. Are, are mobilizing, and there is work being done um, on the federal level. I don't know exactly what the nuclear option is for our national partners, but um, we've been in pretty constant communication with other um, anti-hunger advocacy groups, as well as um, you know the Vermont Food Bank and other groups within Vermont. So there's there's a lot of we've had a lot of practice, I think, at this the, the past couple of years, and <laughs> talking to each other and making sure we're coordinating. Um, so a lot of the language that we're providing um, is in coordination with a national strategy. 
mean, there's no, absolutely no question that there will be lawsuits on multiple levels yes. if the proposed rule gets turned into a final rule. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, I, I would just like to, again, thank the council for taking up this topic, and I would like to remind us all that action is the way <laughs> to uh, to keep these terrible things from happening. So please, um, all of us in this room are we're powerful people. Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, and we have lots of networks uh, of all different kinds, and um, so please use every single one of them to um, flood the federal system with comments. Thank you so much. And in that vein, uh, Aaron, I think now is the appropriate time to make that motion. <laughs> so I, I would move that um, the council uh, submit a uh, submit comments um, uh, raising our profound concern uh, about these proposed uh, regulations uh, and that we ask Ledge Council to uh, draft that uh, on our behalf and I would uh, leave it to uh, maybe the chair and the vice chair given it's a timeliness issue uh, to approve the final draft um, uh, on, uh, to authorize to uh, sign and you know, approve and sign the, the final draft on our behalf. Uh, I'll add a part B, um, which is also to communicate with the Attorney General's office uh, and ask them to consider uh, a, fair, uh, a, a lawsuit uh, to stay uh, the implementation um, and to join with other attorneys general around the country uh, that may be doing the same. Yeah, becomes necessary. Yeah, I'll sign Thank you. Okay, any discussion? <laughs> all right, so all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Great. Thank you. Katie, is that <laughs> clear? <laughs> Thank you very much. Mike, we have this electronically so we could write the comments there. Yep, this on the left side as well. All right. And we'll to 100 for his website as well, so we'll know the council is right there. So thank you all for coming and speaking to us, and we will do our part to try to stop this. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, the legislators usually just write legislative reports during the session, but since we do some work outside of the session, some of our local papers may or may not be willing to publish on that. Mm -hmm. That's true. Okay, well, um, yes. I, I, just, I guess I would underline also that, you know, whatever letter Katie uh, drafts on our behalf, that folks can, you know, should be able to use that individually and, and file um, yes. you know, either that or, or their template. Um, so we, we can do that individually as well. Yeah. Should we think about a press conference? We can do that for the 24th. Because it's, it's we're going to. Our next meeting is after that. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. So once the letter's done, we'll do it. I think maybe the press conference is now the same. Yeah. Okay. Or press release. Yeah. Yes. Okay. If we do take action like that, I would just suggest that we we work with DCF and see what the state's administrative right. response is going to be, and maybe we can do some combination of something. Right. Has the governor uh, spoken on this? Sean said he was putting things together that they had a formal response that they were drafting, right? Yeah, we're working on a formal yeah. response. Will that be something that we would that receive we prior to, or that yeah, we would? Yeah, yeah. We would be more than happy to share once it's final. So. Yeah. But the bully is just the whole day, so it's on the fifth floor. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, yeah. Okay, once the letter's done, we'll put it out and then we'll try to schedule a press conference. Good idea. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, we can move on to Katie, please, and the uh, chart that she, did we, we all have this, the chart that was prepared of the, the recommendations of the council and you know, what actually took place in the legislation. Okay, I'm going to the of the it was posted online after our last meeting updated version. 
there were a lot of, there was a lot of brainstorming about other related legislative action that didn't neatly fall into one of the categories that the committee had um, specifically uh, issued recommendations on. So we have the restoration of the CIS funding under this um, kind of catch-all passage of Act 148 and act relating to adopting protections against housing discrimination for victims of domestic and sexual violence, passage of Act 37, and act relating to repealing the statute of limitations for civil actions based on childhood sexual abuse, and funding to increase payments to foster parents. That's it for that particular document. Good, any comments or questions? So I, I'm sorry to have to quibble um, going back to the VHCD appropriation. I just want to make sure there's no misunderstanding um, the um, way you frame this as one million dollar addition in the amount of operating funds. Sounds mm -hmm. like they're getting administrative funds. It's not operating funds. Um, it was a big pay. The general fund dollars uh, made available through the property transfer tax. Uh, it's not operating funds in the common sense of how one would understand operating funds as, as admin. So I just want to make sure there isn't a misimpression left here that you know, the HCD is getting all kinds of additional administrative funds, which it's not. Um, they're not capital bill dollars. They were appropriated through Act 72 um, as a result of an increase in the property transfer tax, um, which is the the statutory funding source for the HCB, but it's, it's not operating funds in the common sense that one would really understand this. They call them program dollars? They're, they're programmatic dollars. Yeah. Just like the capital, the cap, the capital bill provides programmatic dollars as well. Some of it may well go to admin, but it's, it's basically, you could also just call it general fund, uh, general fund dollars uh, as contrasted with capital bill dollars. Sorry, it's wonky and complicated because the HG funding is through a couple different sources. Would it be possible to just switch out the word operating with programmatic? Would that address I, the I concern? Think I think that would be fine. Okay. Yeah, that is your fund. Okay. I will make that change. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Sure. Yes, we um, I had a note on here that Sarah Phillips question mark. <laughs> the rolling, I don't know, we were trying to get. Did you have something around the November 21st or something? I just had offered to okay. connect with Tom and work okay. with him on outreach, but it's great that the representative did. It's wonderful. I can, I'm certainly happy to follow up and talk with him about the event last year and uh, the work that's needed to you know, do outreach and promote it. Oh, that would be nice. Yeah, I'm happy. And then we can talk about even carpal links too, if any of us are able to do that. About what? Carpal links. Oh, yeah. Everybody goes by my house. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody goes by my house. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
propose at some point that we devote some time, uh, possibly even on the November agenda, because there are some things happening in Rutland County around housing and homelessness. And I'll talk to Sarah. Sarah and I can comment out about that to see if we think it would be a good thing to feature. But I just want to put in a plug for um, doing something. There's a whole lot of studies that are going on, a lot of stuff in the works around housing and homelessness from the uh, voucher work group that uh, Katie just mentioned in, the, in her report to uh, the treasurer is doing a report on uh, uh, creating a thousand units of, uh, of housing over the next um, the next five years. So there's a fair amount of brewing in the housing world that I would want to have some um, suggest that we have some time spent on housing and homelessness. Sure. Yes, that sounds good. Any other? Can I want to make sure. Can I just clarify that the purpose of the meeting in Rutland is a similar purpose to the meeting that we had at St. Johnsbury, which is to hear directly from low-income constituents about their challenges and experiences with Amazon. Yes. Yeah. I agree. And you said sounds great, but I heard October and November for housing. Which one were you thinking? Yeah, I just meant the topic in general. So okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for calling me on it. Um, we already had one request from Voices um, because some poverty data is coming out. Um, Carl says on uh, our meeting date in October. No, no, so, or uh, September. Yeah. Oh, that's so, okay. September. So. Um, uh, normally, um, the vice chair and I do this together with Mike. So shall we just sort of see who might be available? Is September okay to do the housing analysis, or would you rather we wait? In September. Well, October. I mean October. Gosh, yeah. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. the studies are coming out. Well, the, the AHS work group, their report is due. Both Sarah and I are on that. It's due November first, but they're, I'm, I'm yeah. expecting there will be some significant um, findings or recommendations to report on by then. I'm not sure about the treasurer's report on, on housing, but that I guess this issue be fairly far along in that as well. Okay, so we could do both, then we could do the housing homelessness and then the, the poverty data that voices will yeah. In October? In September. In September. September voices. I was just going to add, if you're looking for future agenda topics, I would love an opportunity to update the council about Healthy Grow Vermont and what we're doing with that initiative is all about in terms of um, mitigating the effects of poverty on young children and families, um, in terms of you know, building up positive experiences to mitigate toxic stress and how that really affects the long-term resiliency. Um, and how basically overall how we're streaming through. So I, I imagine some of you aren't familiar with it, and I'd love an opportunity oh, to good. tell you some stories and share data and let you know all about it. And that could be December, whenever it's, you know, there's space on the agenda. Good. And what was the name of the organization? Helping Grow Vermont. I know. Helping Grow Vermont. Well, 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 voices help our ground one. Might be. Well, not the whole meeting. Yeah. <laughs> September, I think, is the 26th. Can't attend that meeting. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. Great. Okay, no, that's, that's okay. We can, we'll put you off then.